Ha, now I even hit the right button. <laughs> um, good afternoon to everyone watching this live and good whatever the time uh, is when you are watching this in a recorded version. Um, really glad that I finally found another good time slot for all this. Um, first of all, in case you hear any, any weird noises from the background, we are currently having a long, long, long overdue rain shower out there. And apparently there's also a little uh, thunderstorm going on, which I am very, very, very happy about because um, before that thing hit and I had another chance to get some fresh air into this office. Office it was at, it was at something like 31 degrees Celsius, uh, Celsius and now it is at least has gone down back to 29, which is still not well, what I could would call cool, but at least it's manageable, especially since I can't run any fans right now. So, please wish me luck that I do not melt while I do this uh, uh, this this broadcast here. Um all right, so um, for uh, the, the, the usual stuff, of course, first of all, the short outline uh, that uh, what, what I'm going to talk to uh, uh, talk to you about today. I hope the sentence made grammatical sense. I'm not sure right now. Um, anyhow, so uh, as usual, I will tell you what I have been up to the past couple of weeks since the last broadcast. Uh, I will also tell you what the next steps will be. Uh, so what I will... Uh, be going to try to tackle next, and uh, finally, then we will also have a, a Q A Q and A session, which thankfully uh, grew larger than expected when I started working on the outline. Because uh, it, actually, yesterday some some patrons still handed in more, some more questions, so yeah, there's now now actually quite some stuff to answer. But just in case it doesn't suffice, or of course, if you have any uh, those of you watching this live have any burning under the nails uh, during. Uh, this broad during this live broadcast, uh, we of course once again have a live chat. For those of you watching this on desktop, it is on the right, and for those of you watching this on mobile, it should be down below the video. Okay, uh, and I will as always keep an eye on that. For me, it's there. Um, and if there is anything on there that is, uh, yeah, that looks like it's burning under someone's nails, then I will also look that I uh, squeeze it in. All right. So, what I've been up to. Um, you might have noticed that three days ago uh, there was a release announcement, so uh, I pushed out 139 uh, stable. Um, and before that there were also four release candidates from, uh, I think the first one was on June 20th and the last one on July 20th, which by the way was a, uh, was a, was a pure coincidence. I did not plan to space them exactly on the same day of the month. Um, yeah. Um, so the final release of the of the of the proper stable version was on uh, Wednesday, July twenty fifth, and so far, based on the feedback that I'm getting, well, or rather the the lack of the feedback I'm getting, I'm assuming that everything more or less went well, um, and and uh, the the release candidates proved to iron out any actual issues that were still in there. I have. Um, yeah, I observe currently the usual increase in tickets of update update failures that I, I um, yeah I always get a slight uptick in that, of course during um, uh, when I push out updates. Some of them indicate that there might be some dependency issues with very old versions of Python and or pip. I have not yet properly found out what exactly the problem is. So far, the only thing that I've seen is that apparently Octopi, uh, for those of you who are still running Octopi 012, first of all, please update to a new version because this is not even supported by Debian anymore. And also, um, yeah, the Python and pip versions in there are so outdated that they apparently cause issues with some of the third party dependencies within Octoprint. I admittedly did not test against this version because by now it's uh, I think four or five years old, and uh, yeah, frankly, I already have my hands full with testing the uh, a bit more recent versions. So yeah, just in case you have Octopi 0.12 and are about to update to Octoprint 139, maybe keep this in mind and make sure that you have uh, yeah at least updated everything on this on this uh, instance that you can update. And also take a look at the announcement I pushed out back in November 2017 about issues with uh, PIP, uh, with the PIP version that comes with Octopi 012, because apparently that was also a problem for some of the people who reported issues updating 2139. I have no idea why they didn't run into updates uh, 
into any problems updating to 138 but or 137 for that matter but um yeah well uh, as i said so far i don't know exactly what is going on there but apparently very very old python and pip versions might be a problem uh, due to some third party dependencies so if you run something that is older than let's say yeah let's say 3 years maybe um be careful and if 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 uh, if possible at all please think about updating because I try, I mean, I can update anything security critical and all that in, in Octoprint releases, but if you don't keep your operating system underneath uh, updated and you can't do that anymore with, uh, with, with, with versions that aren't even supported and not getting any updates anymore, then, well, you are running at risk a bit. All right. Um, I also got some issues reported with regards to timeouts under certain circumstances with some firmware. So I think that was two or three tickets or something. But yeah, so far it looks more like that might be misbehaving firmware. Uh, I'm not entirely sure yet. Um, all in all, it would help me tremendously if you've already updated to 139 uh, to please give me a little ping somewhere maybe as a comment to the to the release announcement on the Octo blog, just so that I know that, um, yeah, people are actually updating to that version and not experiencing any issues because right now it once again feels a bit like everything is just not working because only the people who, yeah, usually only the people who experience problems report back and those who don't re experience problems uh, don't report back and I'm in left in the dark thinking, hmm, uh, what, what's happening here? So, yeah. Um, Anyhow, uh, what I also did was working on Octoprint 1.3.10 or what is going to be Octoprint 1.3.10, so the next maintenance release. And there are two uh, yeah, f things that I'm fairly excited about that I want to tell you uh, about that I introduced there. So first of all, um, you might remember or might have noticed that since oh, I think 1.3.5 or 1.3.4, I don't even know when I introduced it. So a couple of versions ago, I added a bundled Octopi uh, support plugin, uh, which currently only in the current versions only um, takes care of if you are running Octoprint on Octopi, it will detect that and only then enable itself. And if so, it will uh, look for the version number of Octopi and display that in the lock and also on Octoprint's UI. And this really, really helped a lot in the past with um, yeah, debugging uh, issues reported by people and such, because usually a lot of people don't know which Octopi version they are actually running. And now they have a chance to know simply by looking into their logs or on the, on the UI. And all, I also have a chance to know because uh, if they do what they are supposed to do when reporting a bug and uh, also include the log files, then I'll see the version and know, ah, okay, uh, that and that version, and then, then I can try to properly reproduce. So anyhow, this plugin so far only did this version stuff. Uh, and then I realized that, a lot, uh, that there actually is a number of people who are running um, into issues with um, things like uh, yeah, under voltage problems, overheating problems over the last couple of years that has caused a huge amount of support requests. Um, so weird, completely unexplainable uh, things and happening weir uh, weird uh, communication issues with the printer or the Pi suddenly falling off the network and stuff like that. And a ton of these issues can be traced back to under voltage or, or insufficient um, current uh, supplied by the power supply to the Raspberry Pi. And the Raspberry Pi really, really doesn't seem to like that at all. And uh, instead of, um, yeah, I don't know, flashing some LEDs, the only thing that it does actually since a couple of versions now is that it, um, that it uh, a couple of versions ago introduced a small new command called VC gen command get throttle, so subcommand of the existing VG, VC gen CMD uh, command, um, which allows you to get a bit mask, so a, a bit field that tells you whether overheating occurred, whether under voltage occurred, and also if it's occurring right now. And what I did now is that I turned the bundled Octopi support plugin into a Pi support plugin. And uh, that will also still do the, when it detects Octopi, it will also still do the version uh, collection stuff, logging it to the lock and also logging it to uh, showing it on the UI. But what it will also do is regularly check whether, and my screens just went off. 
ah, nice, <laughs> uh, is um, that it will check regularly if one of these bits, one of these flags is set via this command. So it will just over and over call it in the background every, I think, five minutes or something like that. And if so, it will do what the what if you're using a, a Raspberry Pi with the with the included UI on a on a screen, and so you might already have seen it will display a small a small bolt in the in the taskbar um, if the Pi experienced under voltage, and it will also display a small temperature symbol in the taskbar and taskbar in the navigation bar. Sorry, um, if the if, if it experienced uh, overheat uh, overheating, and um, just to show you how this will look. I've prepared a small um, fake test. Admittedly, I saw, so cool here. I'm just faking the output of the of the of the command because um, it is hot in here, but I still could not get the Pi to overheat. <laughs> and under voltage, uh, I, I did not want to now fumble around with the new power supply that I got for testing this stuff. Um, so I figured I'd just set up my quick development demo just so you see how this looks. And I just need to quickly switch over. Now, you hopefully are seeing this and what you're, what is new here is this up here. So I've currently set it to fake that it's currently experiencing under voltage, which is why this thing is blinking. Um, and that it in the past somehow experienced um, uh, overheating. And I don't know why. Nah. Apparently, I still have to check some stuff here. Okay, now it's uh, coming back. And uh, it also explains what the icons mean. And since there are a couple of plugins out there already, which use the bolt symbol to indicate some kind of power switching or something like that, um, I decided to just um, uh, append uh, an exclamation mark to it. And I hope this makes it very well distinguishable from the existing uh, navigation elements provided by those plugins so that you will not get confused by it. Um, yeah, so this is the one nice thing that I'm very, very happy to have in there because I really hope that it will soon help with a lot of problems that I have run into in the past during support. And it will also have people to maybe self-help, you know, like they see this and they immediately know, oh, okay, something might be wrong here and I should look into this and not be surprised <laughs> when stuff breaks. Now, um, and since it's now a generic Pi support plugin instead of just an OctoPi support plugin, I uh, might also add some more uh, Pi specific stuff in the future there. Um, of course, if you are not running OctoPrint on the Pi, um, Oct the, the plugin, the bundle plugin will detect that and not enable itself. So you don't have to worry about this interfering somehow with if you have, if you have it installed in an Orange Pi or in a Windows box or whatever. Um, if it doesn't see that it is a Pi that it's running on, then it will just say, mm -hmm, nope, I'm not going to load myself. Um, yeah, and as I said, I'm, I'm thinking about maybe adding some other Pi specific stuff that is causing people grief. Um, recently just had a discussion on Twitter with someone who was just suggesting to maybe display a warning if the user hasn't changed their SSH standard uh, login password. Password. So the, the usually Octopi uh, ships with the same uh, username password combination that Raspberry and ships with, uh, which is username Pi and password Raspberry. And the official install uh, instructions for Octopi actually say, please change the password as ba ba basically before you ever load Octoprint in your browser. But a lot of people either intentionally or unintentionally <laughs> seem to miss this step. So um, yeah, it might be interesting to maybe see if we can't detect this and also uh, warn people anyhow. Um, that was one thing. And the other thing is something uh, I've been meaning to do for maybe over, um, yeah, maybe maybe a year or even more now, is I finally added a bundled tracking plugin. And before you now scream, oh my god, no, she's going to try to spy on us. No, it will be strictly opt-in only. So um, once you uh, install, install Octoprint 1310 or, or any of its uh, of, of the current development versions or, uh, or, or the RCs or something, you will be asked, yo, listen, um, I want to collect some data so that I know how many instances are out there, um, what sort of hardware they run on, what version they run on, so uh, so that I know is 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 the current release really being installed and being used, or is just nobody installing it, stuff like that. Yeah, and also um, yeah, some some information about uh, ongoing prints 
as in not what you are printing. I'm not interested in what you what you are printing. I just want to know uh, how long you are, uh, what 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 the length is of the print jobs that you are running, uh, so that I can also you know get a feeling for the stability of the system. So if I know that a lot of people are running the current release with 20 hour prints that I can feel, can be fairly sure that everything is running smoothly. If uh, suddenly uh, all the print durations drop down to two minutes, I know, hmm, okay, something is wrong here. Um, so things like that. And um, the reason is simply that I actually even want something in this as much as I hate tracking of any kind myself. Um, I've been completely flying blind the last couple of years. So I have actually no idea at all how many Octoprint instances are out there. Um, I have no idea what versions they run. I have no idea on what hardware, the hardware they run. I don't know what plugins are being used, which is also fairly interesting to know um, in order to maybe, you know, add functionality that supports these kinds of plugins even more. Um, things like this are just yeah, metrics that I completely lack so far. And that is actually causing me a lot of personal stress uh, due to the fact that really after every single update and after every release candidate, I just sit there and think, okay, is, is the silence now because nobody's using that or is the silence now happening because uh, there is no issue? So I hope to resolve this problem in the future. And it will also give me something to base... Um, yeah, analysis is on and and also to see what what um, since since I also will make it so that it will track if you allow it to more more on that later um, if you if if you allow it to to track um, firmware information that your printer sends when you connect to it then I will also know what kind of printer firmwares are out there and maybe be able to react to new versions faster and all that. Um, yeah, so this is the idea behind that. Uh, once again, as I said, uh, this will be strictly opt-in only, so it will not do anything until you allow it to do it uh, through the wizard. And you can also limit what it will track further uh, through the settings dialog, where you will be able to unselect everything besides a, a small regular ping, which is uh, the most basic form of tracking. And if you even don't want that, then, then just disable it altogether or just not enable it altogether. So the idea here is really to keep you in full control of if and if so, what is even being sent. But if you opt in to do that and help me, um, it, uh, yeah, it will, will hopefully really help a lot in, um, in, 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 yeah, in, structuring future development decisions and um, and also just getting a better idea of if a release is stable or not, which is basically really the, the most pressing um, issue for me with, with implementing this. Ah. Um, maybe for those of us wondering how I did this, so I'm not using any cloud-based third-party tracking software or, or something like that. I took a look at some of them and decided, eh, I, I don't know how they are using the data that they receive and I don't know if I can trust them to not use it in some way that I don't agree with and that you don't agree with. So instead I set up a completely yeah, self-built um, solution basically. So I have now, um, I've now uh, set up a, a, a dedicated new um, server for that for that that acts as both the tracking endpoint for the plugin in octoprint and also for um the the software package or rather the software stack that i'm using for analysis so what i, I uh, if any of you is familiar with that i'm using Elasticsearch plus uh, logstash plus kibana so the elk stack and um first tests are really exciting so uh, I've, I've merged i merged this on the maintenance branch i think 14 days ago and on the devil branch as well and uh, currently there are 21 active users worldwide <laughs> in this system of course i mean there are hopefully more than 21 but um, uh, right now there are 21 uh, people already in there and every time uh, someone new pops up on the uh yeah on the on the in the in the analysis results in the on the dashboard that was the word that i was looking for i'm just like ah 
another one, another one. And it's really, really exciting to see that. Yeah, I also, uh, what I also did is, um, so when you, when, when Octoprint sends the tracking events to the server, um, before everything gets pu pushed into the analysis stack, it will first, uh, it will strip the, 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 the client IP. So uh, I, I have no idea what IP you have when, um, yeah, when, when, when the stuff enters the system, which is also something that I had to consider due to the GDPR, because the IP is a personal identifi identifiable information according to the to uh, European law. Anyhow, what I do before I do this is I um, at least uh, determine a rough ge geographic position. So I know, for example, that currently I think there are five instances in the US but I do not know who that is. I do not know uh, uh, what what if if those instances are from the same person, so from the same originating IP, or if there are different ones. So yeah, I'm I'm trying to really only only collect the data that makes sense for me to know. And personally, I mean, this is this 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 geographical uh, position information is uh, actually not anything that will. Um, yeah, do a whole lot for Octoprint's further development. But honestly, that is something for me because it really helps to see that the work that I do is used worldwide. And this is going to help with making this a bit more tangible for me and will hopefully, yeah, help to lighten the mood in some cases when uh, a day is really, really, really stressful. So, but as I said, strictly opt in. You decide if you want to participate in that or not. And uh, I've also set up a website on uh, tracking.octoprint.org where everything is explained that which what is collected and which parts of that can be opted out of as well. And yeah, I hope I've made it as transparent as possible. Uh, if not, please, um, yeah, please just uh, ping me and tell me how I could improve. Um, and um, yeah, uh, what, I, what it has already helped me in any case is that um, right now, I think we are at something like an accumulated duration, print duration of 230 hours over the last 14 uh, days. And I know those 230 hours went against the com layer, which is basically the same one that's inside 139. So I know that it's, it can't be completely broken despite some, uh, timeout issues being reported, um, which make me nervous because as I said, I don't know if there are more people uh, out there who are simply not saying anything or anything, but yeah. And also fairly interesting is uh, top print duration so far, 14 hours. So that was also like, whoa, okay, nice. <laughs> yeah. And I also hope to be able um, to provide some public, public stats based on this data in the future. So um, things like most uh, commonly used Raspberry Pi model uh, or or um, or um, sorry I was just distracted by the live chat uh, going uh, to answer that soon um, um, and now I lost my train of thought I blame the heat uh, currently back to 30 degrees um, what did I want? Uh, public stats, right. Okay. So something like uh, used Raspberry Pi, fav uh, most commonly used Raspberry Pi model. Uh, also things like which Python versions are uh, uh, used the most, which of course helps me to know where I should look for compatibility tests. Um, things like the printer firmwares that are used the most. Yeah. Stuff like that, which will, will hopefully help. And also, of course, if the printer firmware not only reports a firmware, but also a model number, which so far, at least the Prusa models encoded in the firmware string. So I know at least roughly, okay, this is probably an original Prusa printer. So this will also allow some more details with regards to printer popularity. But well, yeah, right now it's more firmware than printer centric. Okay, so Brian just asked um, where to get this telemetry plugin and if it's only available in the Devil branch or installable from the repository on 139. So it, it needs some changes. Um, it needed some internal changes. Uh, so it's currently only av available either on the maintenance branch, so what is going to be 1310, or uh, on the Devil branch, so which is what what is going to be 140. Um, it is 
also a bundle plugin, so there's no separate repository for it or anything. It will just be part of the source that Octoprint comes with. Basically the same like the plugin manager or the, uh, the software update plugin or the announcement plugin or the Pi support plugin, stuff like that. Okay. Um, Wow, and this is taking a lot longer than I thought it would. Um, let me quickly come to the next thing that I did, uh, which is, of course, continuing to work on 1.4.0. Uh, those of you following these um, yeah, these Octoprint on Air streams uh, a bit longer know that I've finally gotten back to work on the new com layer. And uh, when I spoke to you about this the last time, so in episode 17, I said that I had not yet uh, done uh, any any printing with it. Uh, because back then it also was too hot <laughs> and I was still ironing out some, some things, but was pro, uh, uh, um, fairly optimistic that I would be able to do a first print soon. And I was, uh, yeah, so that thing now uh, did its first print, um, completed well, no issues <clears throat> so far. Um, what I also did in the meantime was I finally implemented uh, the SD card upload back into the new com layer, so I could also do some uh, some some speed tests, not hindered by the printer actually having to perform mechanic movements, but just by how fast I can stream stuff to the printer uh, over the com layer. And I'm happy to report that uh, yeah, it's it's not slower than the current one. In one test, it was actually four times faster. But yeah, I could not reproduce this. I don't know what was up there because I checked and double checked and triple checked the, this result, this particular result and, and looked through the locks and all that. And it actually was four times faster in that particular case. But yeah, for, for some reason so far, I have not been able to reproduce that, but I'm keeping my eye on this because this really, yeah, confused me tremendously, this result. Anyhow, uh, you could consider now that uh, a first milestone for this new com layer has been reached. It's printing, it's working, it can stream SD files, uh, the new connection dialog also works fine, which now allows you to select all the new printer parameters that are available due to the uh, restructuring of uh, within the com layer. Um, what is still to do is a lot of small stuff. So I, I've already done a, a quiet. Um, yeah, quiet some bits of keeping it in sync with changes for maintenance. So since I started work on this uh, about two years ago or so, on this particular version of the new com layer, um, a bunch of stuff has been added to the maintenance releases. And now I have to also migrate that or rather port that over to the new com layer. And uh, yeah, quite a huge amount of this has already happened, but some things I still have to take a look at. Um, I also want to refactor the printer profiles because right now, as you know, the printer profiles only contain information about yeah, basically the physical properties of your machine. But I also want to get the connection information and all that into this, uh, into these profiles and the firmware um, flavors and all that. So and make them shareable e uh, easily, preferably. But yeah, let's see about that. If I actually can uh, can can do this already for one for all, we'll have to see. But um, yeah, the idea here really is that it, just by selecting a profile, everything will be set up. You won't have to think about port, port, ports and port rates and firmware settings and recent errors and, and all that. So all this stuff will be taken care of in the future by just selecting one printer profile, hopefully. This is the goal at least. And also a bunch of these small features um, like pause triggers, recovery data recording, uh, temperature offsets uh, are still missing that I still have to implement. And I also remember some UI issues <laughs> that I have to take care of. But uh, yeah, those will be the ne next steps. Speaking about next steps. So uh, first of all, I will have to figure out if there really is some kind of problem with 139 or if it's just the usual noise uh, generated during updates. So far, my gut feeling tells me it's just the usual noise, but yeah, I want to make sure. Um, then for, for 1.3.10, uh, there's another thing that I really want to get added into uh, that uh, next release, apart from the usual bug fixes and, and improvements, of course. Um, before the forum existed, uh, there was um, a discussion between me and Aldo Hoban, who you, who you might know as Field of View, who also did the Octoprint plugin for Cura. 
um, about uh, some new mechanism for clients like the Octoprint plugin for Kira to register with Octoprint without you having manual having to manually copy over the API key or um, or in in case of mobile uh, clients having to um, take a picture of the included QR code. Uh, basically, going more the way of like uh, OAuth uh, um, workflows where um, you get a prompt whether you want to allow uh, this and this client to access your uh, instance and you can say yes or no. And if you say yes, then the client basically self sets up everything so that it can talk to you. Um, and uh, yeah, so this is something that I now want to really get into 1.3.10. And since Aldo currently is not available to uh, yeah to do this together, basically we decided okay, uh, I will do this. But of course, it's it was his idea, and he really should get a credit for this idea. Um, but yeah, this is this is something I actually started working on today uh, to to get this into 1.3.10. Um, and as I said, yeah, there are also a couple of bug reports that have accumulated on GitHub while I was busy with 139 um, that I now have to take a look at. And also it's getting way, way hotter from from second to second in here. Ugh. Okay. Um, yeah. And for 140, as I said, I want to sm tackle all those small but annoying um, things that uh, still need to be tackled. And then I need to give this some, some really serious testing, which right now I simply refuse to do <laughs> because... Yeah, 30 degrees in my office. I really don't want to add running printers to to, to this on top of uh, the PC producing heat. So <clears throat> I'm hoping to soon get a chance again with a bit uh, less intense weather <laughs> to give uh, this some more tests. And well, yeah, uh, once that's done, uh, before I merge it, I, I'll try to find some more victims <laughs> to test it. Uh, as well, while it's still in the separate branch, just to make sure that I haven't forgotten anything glaringly obvious before yeah, merging it on the devil branch and offering it to a larger audience. So yeah, let's see. Okay, so that was what my next steps will be. So let's continue with the Q&A section. And just like last time, I've once again prepared, ah, prepared there prepared a little uh, presentation thingy, which I just now have to quickly uh, switch to, hopefully without hitting the wrong button button again. Haha. -ha. Okay. So um, the first question by Chris H is, has there been an uptick in plug-in activity lately or am I just seeing it more? So um, it was my feeling as well that there was way more activity lately, but uh, yeah, since I don't want to report on my personal feelings, I <laughs> got curious, whipped up a small bash script to provide me with some stats. And the result is this lovely chart. So um, what we see here is uh, basically that, uh, yeah, it indeed appears to be a slight uptick compared to the previous months until uh, February, back until February. But not as huge of an uptick as apparently there was back in January. So, um, yeah. Um, personally, I'd be happy if the growth continues like it currently does. Um, but yeah, I can't force people to write plugins. Um, in any case, I found this uh, little graph very, very interesting and I've saved the, the script I uh, used to generate it or rather to, to extract the data that I used to then generate it to um, yeah, to do that a couple of times in the future. Um, what this graph, or rather what the data also tells us, is that uh, there is a, an average of 3.1 uh, plugins per month ever since uh, yeah ever since the inception of the plugin repo repository back in uh, May 2015. Um, the peak so far was January 2018 with Elf registered plugins, and we also had a couple of months where no plugins at all were newly registered, which um, yeah, we're February, March, May, July, and November of 2016 and November of 2017, which uh, makes me think maybe there is a pattern and November 2018 will also not see any plugins registered, but you can help, uh, you can help avoid this. <laughs> yeah. Um, 
Uh, just in case you didn't know this, by the way, um, a long time now, Octoprint has always sent you a little, uh, a little uh, notification announcement thingy whenever there is a new plugin registered in the repository. And I kind of imagine that when there are a lot of them and you don't, yeah, you don't open up your Octoprint uh, instance daily like I am to to tell those things. Okay, I've seen you. Um, that might be annoying a bit. So. Uh, in case you're not interested in getting these in, uh, notifications, I thought I uh, I should just clarify that it's easy to just disable them um, because, uh, yeah, there are settings for the announcement plugin. Um, if you go into Octoprint settings announcements or from the announcement dialog that you get by, cl get by clicking on a little bell uh, and in the lower left there is a, a small uh, wrench icon, um, yeah, if you go there, you see this and there you can simply disable each and every channel besides the important announcements. Um, the important announcements I kept undisableable because those I really, really only use when there is a really, really pressing need to use it. And if you also don't want that, then just disable the announcement plugin. Um, but yeah, you can uh, more or less granularly control what kind of announcements you get there um, just in case you are annoyed by the plugin repository announcement, disable them there. <laughs> okay, um, then the next question, ah, yeah, there. Uh, the next question is actually two questions which were fairly um, similar in nature. So I figured I'd just uh, lump them together. And the first one is by Ian Douglas. Has any thought been given to making a mobile-friendly version of the UI? Another one by eVault uh, for PC. The HTML code seems to be set to one uh, to 10, uh, 24 screen width. Is it possible to set it to 1280 or dynamic? So um, first of all, to the question, has any thought been given? So uh, a lot of thought has been given. <laughs> Um, the problem, though, is, and I think I mentioned it in the past as well, uh, backwards compatibility. So, sorry. Uh, all, the, all those plugins that we just saw in the previous graph uh, that are currently on the um, uh, registered on the repository, and if they have any kind of UI component, they depend on the existing current existing UI. Um, and in order to make said UI responsive and more modern and better fitting the huge amount of screen uh, resolutions and also aspect ratios that we that we are um, yeah that 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 are out there these days, um, I, I would basically have to rewrite it. Also, since it's currently using a way way outdated version of Bootstrap and all that. Um, but if I do that, then it's very, very, very likely, likely that none of those, I think, 129 uh, plugins currently on the repo that actually do have UI uh, components. Uh, so th those of those that have UI components will still work. So that would not be good. And I think the plugin authors maintaining those plugins would be slightly mad at me. So um, um what I did in order to prepare a solution for this is uh, back in 1.3.0, I introduced UI plugins as a new mix-in. So basically a plugin type that allows you to completely replace the existing user interface um, with provided by a plugin. Uh, oh my God, and I hope I'm still online because YouTube is still going boop, boop, up there. Yeah. Um, so. UI plugins allow you to basically provide a plugin that um, builds an alternative uh, user interface. And my idea currently is to yeah, basically introduce a new UI as a parallel option first, provided through this UI plugin and allowing users to toggle between the two, and then giving plugin authors a chance to one by one move over there and, and, and basically allow their plugins to work with both versions and then someday just yeah getting rid of the old one um but this is most likely not going to happen in one for all uh, because yeah i already have se several huge topics uh, to tackle in that one so the first one was the new permission system the second one is now the new com layer um, there are some other things that I've uh, scheduled for one for all, for example, something like custom uh, values on, on the temperature graphs and all that, um, that I really need to get out now and get into that. And I, I don't want to deprioritize anything of that for a new UI, honestly, because this stuff has been burning under my nail even longer. <clears throat> and hence it might 
yeah take a bit longer until I get around to this. Um, for a bit more responsiveness now, there are actually quite a number of plugins already that do, yeah, uh, yeah, basically do modify the existing UI. Uh, of course, there's Touch UI that most of you probably know. Um, then there's also Screen Squish, which um, adds some responsiveness to the existing uh, Bootstrap, which I think at least should allow it to to uh, use the whole width of the browser and all that. And I've also seen people recommend uh, Themeify settings. Uh, so for the Themeify plugin <coughs> to yeah, change things around a bit. Um, I definitely would welcome people to play around with the UI plugin API and maybe just, you know, come up with their own solution uh, for a new and shiny great UI and maybe get it, just get it included by default then. Um, the thing is that so far I only ever saw two companies utilize the, the functionality and the, the possibilities that this this API uh, or rather this, this mix-in offers and actually I have to say that I'm a bit disappointed by that. <laughs> when I introduced that uh, UI plugin stuff I thought that hey now go people are probably going to go nuts with this and uh, creating awesome new things and yeah instead two companies and that's it. Hmm. We can do better, I think. <laughs> All right. Um, then next question by an anonymous uh, questioner, questioner, whatever, inquirer. Um, can the user interface be changed or condensed easily? I find myself swapping back and forth from the machine jock control page to the temp and extruder on off page a lot. Having all the main controls on a single user interface would be helpful. Any CNC machine interface you could take inspiration from. First of all, I don't have a CNC machine, so I have no nothing to take an inspiration on. But that being said, it's possible to have uh, plugins replace certain components or suppress multiple components. Uh, it's also possible to have plugins join existing components, so stuff like the whole temperature tab or the uh, and the whole webcam tab uh, control tab, which also includes the webcam, into one. So it's uh, perfectly possible to write a plugin that removes the control and temperature tabs and then uh, adds an, a new uh, tab that joins the two. Um, basically points down to creating a plugin that uh, implements the template plugin and the asset plugin. Mix in, um, create a new Jinja2 template that includes the two that you want to join and then have a custom view model take care of doing some forwarding of system events so that the webcam view and the temperature graph initialize properly. And I know all this very well because I tried it yesterday. Um, so um, I've preferred a little. Uh, I preferred. Uh, I pr prepared. Oh, oh. <laughs> I've prepared a little demo how this could look, or actually how you can make it look if you install a small plugin that I whipped up. Now I just have to hit the right buttons again. Okay. Um, in which one did I install this again? I think in that one. Yeah. Uh, as you see, it still has some problems because it sometimes loses the webcam stream again. But what you see here is. Uh, uh, a view of what was the control tab and what was the temperature tab built, uh, built into one. And as you see, those two original tabs are no longer up there. I'm a bit confused right now. Apparently they are up there. Okay, I have to look into why it does this, but in theory, um, you now have them have that stuff in here. And if I was now logged in, which I am not, because this is a um, this is a, an anonymous anonymous session, you would also have the control tabs are down here. So uh, yeah, in theory it works. It might take some time to iron out all the kinks, which I, I have to admit I did not feel comfortable investing. But just go to my GitHub uh, profile and take a look at the repositories that I have, you will uh, easily find it. I'm not going to register this in the plugin repository because this really is only a proof of concept how something like this could be done, uh, could be done to show people who are interested in looking into this kind of functionality. Um, and as you see, it still has some issues. So um, I don't want to have to maintain this. Uh, I actually don't have the time to maintain this. So um, here is again a screenshot of how it looks uh, when you are logged in and down there, there is also the little URL that you can um, 
find all this at. As I said, uh, no support in any way. This is not really maintained or anything. It's really just a proof of concept. The README also says that, but it's there if you want to play around with it. Um, and I really don't want to merge these two screens per default for everyone, because I think that really, really would overload the already overloaded UI and confuse people in the process. So uh, yeah, it will be something left to have um, plugins take care of. All right, now I, let, let me quickly take a look at the live chat before I continue here. Why not add WebSocket streams parallel to the API so anyone basically could build a completely new UI? Well, they they already can. They don't need anything else but what is already there. The existing UI, uh, as you see, it already uses the functions completely by using the existing REST API, which is documented on docs.octoprint.org, and also using the push uh, API, which is based on WebSockets, if WebSockets are supported, and otherwise it falls back to long polling and all that, through SockJS. Uh, so yeah, all the tools are there. Uh, and th the whole point is that uh, you would basically do something like create a UI plugin and utilize the existing API to do everything that the existing Octoprint uh, UI can do. Um, yeah, at least that's the idea behind things. Um, and another question by Brian from the live chat or, or rather a suggestion, I think. You also could just add a custom parametric control for temperature on the controls page, although you can't see the temperature, but then you can add the status bar temp plugin. Yeah, of course, you could also just do that. Um, so basically using the custom control feature. Uh, sorry, I'm getting distracted by the chat again, and usually I, I can cope with this better, but <laughs> not in this temperature. Um, and there goes my train of thought again. Yeah. I'll let you know when I find it again. Um, another note here by SA arrow one, it would be wonderful if the next generation UI allowed more than one main column and more than one visible tab. Yeah, I completely agree. Um, of course, it would need to adapt to the existing uh, space. So you don't want more than one col column on something like an, a phone. But on, a, on an ultra wide monitor, you definitely want more than one column. So um, yeah, as I said, I've put a lot of thoughts uh, of, of thought in into this stuff um, when I was not currently working on something else, like when I was eating or waiting to finally fall asleep or <laughs> under the shower or stuff like that. Um, basically, every time that my brain was not busy currently debugging something, I was thinking about stuff like that. And um, yeah, I have a lot of ideas that I would like to see turned into reality, but right now I simply can't yeah, commit to also working on that on top of everything else. So yeah, it will be some time unless uh, someone else does it or, or coordinates with me and does the busy work or something like that. Yeah. Um, Okay, next question. Uh, also by an anonymous user. I don't know if it was the same one, but <laughs> uh, any plans to improve the initial plugin installation process? Now that there are so many nice plugins, it would be very, very helpful to be able to export a list of install plugins as JSON or similar from the web GUI, feed that list to another Octoprint instance and have it install everything in one go. Similarly, a textual config export import system in the web GUI would simplify the process of setting up multiple Octoprint servers. Um, the question, uh, the, the answer to any plans is, by, is by the way, oops, it was a bit too early, uh, is by the way, usually, yes. <laughs> um, it, about this one, this is also one of these things that I've thought about uh, a lot during those downtime moments, um, more in, more in the, in the way of, of some kind of built in backup restore tool. So basically like, you know, for example, from, from, uh, from, uh, router front ends or something where you can. Um, back up the whole, the, all, all of the conf configuration, and then easily restore it on an, on another one, or uh, after after hard resetting the router or something like that. Um, and um, <laughs> as as uh, as S A Arrow One just said in the chat, uh, who apparently this question was from uh, this, uh, yeah, this is also something that I want to get into because I want uh, people to be easily able to update from old Octopi versions. 
Um, and using something, some mechanism like this would also probably be easy. Uh, easy ca could easily be used for bootstrapping multiple installs or something like that. And it certainly would come in very, very handy for testing as well. Um, I also talked about it on the ISC channel a couple of times with someone who it was, I can't remember, sadly. And uh, that someone said they wanted to look into it, but so far I haven't heard anything about it anymore. So, yeah. Um, the link you already saw pop up it there once is that, um, yeah, the, the forum user outsourced guru um, has uh, recently prepared uh, a small upgrade helper script. So it's not fully automated yet. Uh, you can find it at that URL, discourseoctopan.org slash t uh, slash 1786. Uh, and of course, I will also put those things in the description on the published video and all that. Um, and this at least automates some parts. Uh, so the plugin install stuff is not yet automated. And that brings me to the, pr the challenge with any kind of uh, full uh, backup um, solution. Um, where to get all the plugins? So Octoprint knows the identifiers of installed plugins. It knows where on the system it's installed. But what it does not know is where that plugin came from. So uh, the thing is that you do not necess necessarily have to install plugins through Octoprint's UI. You could just install them uh, via command line, via pip. Uh, you could just have them developed locally and installed directly via pip, uh, stuff like this. Um, and not all plugins that people have installed, even if they have have them installed from, from some online URL or something, they don't actually need to be in the plugin repository. So if you do a quick search on, on GitHub uh, just for some Octoprint plugin, um, yeah, mix in names or something, uh, you can find a ton of plugins that are simply not registered in the in the repository because their authors choose to so far not so far or, or not at all do that. And I can't tell you why, <laughs> but uh, yeah, those plugins, I, I guess, are also being used. So um, figuring out if I have some kind of backup information that tells me there is some plugin foo uh, where that who thing came from if it's not actually reg registered on the, of, uh, on the official uh, plugin repository will get really, really tricky, if not impossible. Um, what would work is something like just compiling that, that list and anything that I can't find uh, on the repository during restore prompt the user to install manually. But of course, this is also a bit meh, leaves, leaves a bad taste because it's not a full, full featured um, uh, thing, um, <laughs> full feature thing. Good, Gina. Uh, uh, not a full feature solution. Um, what I do not want to do is start trying to, um, yeah, collect all the, all the files from an ins existing pip installation and bundle them into some kind of uh, backup because uh, this is just bound to cause issues with changes in pip version and changes in underlying Python version and possibly also changing in installation position and all that. So this is just going to yeah be horrible. So I fear if push comes to shove, it will boil down to just having this list and marking everything that can't be found on the on the public repository and asking people to yeah figure out where they found it. Maybe logging at least the homepage information. Uh, as well, so that people then just hopefully be able, will be able to find the plugin on the plugin's registered homepage. Yeah. Um, and sadly, of course, still, uh, yeah, the issue here is someone still needs to write this backup and restore plugin as usual. I would love to, but you know, uh, you know the gist. Um, I already have my hands full with everything I'm doing. So if if it if it is me who will write it, it will take some time until I get around to do it. Um, but this is certainly something that someone from the community could tackle. And uh, yeah, I would also be happy to bundle something like that. Um, so we don't have to make it an, a, a separate, separate third party plugin. So if, uh, yeah, if it's, uh, it's uh, certainly possible to bundle good plugins. Well, okay. And we already have nearly six o'clock. Well, um, but we also only have one question left. So we just go a bit into overtime. <laughs> um, Joris asked, is there a way or a plugin to change settings, speed, temperature, or flow uh, during the print, but not at that time, but at layer number or from height? 
Many times I start a print and just settings for one part, but I know I can speed up later or have to slow down the last part and forget to set that in a G code. Um, uh, I guess probably uh, all of you can already guess what I'm going to say. It could be done through a plugin. <laughs> Um, the tricky thing here is, uh, or might be, things like z-hops within the g-code, so where it would actually jump up to the z-height that you have configured, but would not really be there yet, because it would jump out, down again and only a layer after actually be at that z-height. Um, so this would have to be taken into account when writing something like this, and uh, maybe try to calculate it out so the g-code viewer is already uh, adapted to detect z-hops and not put them into their own layers and the time-lapse plugin also tries to do that as far as it can. Um, so this would probably be possible. Um, and uh, yeah, so the basic approach to this would just be writing a plugin that um, yeah allows defining some actions probably from a predefined set of things to do or maybe just in form of short g-code snippets to do at certain heights or at certain layer numbers, whereas layer numbers, once again, can be a bit tricky. Um, Z heights are probably uh, yeah the safer approach. Um, and once the Z height with that action is, is reached and the command has been sent to the printer, then the plugin would trigger whatever uh, G-code it needs to trigger in order to fill, for fulfill the action at this point. And um, yeah, that should should work, I guess. I haven't of, I haven't tried that one, <laughs> but um, yeah, that would be the basic the basic idea. So it, it, it certainly is possible. Just someone has to write it, which uh, probably won't be me because it's the above. <laughs> okay, um, that was the last question from the backlog. Uh, let me quickly take a look at if, if I've missed anything from the live chat. Holy cow, it's, it's, it's really hot in here. Um, and I think I don't. Or I think I haven't rather. See, my, my English uh, is already uh, dying as well. <laughs> okay, uh, so that means I can switch back to me, I think. Uh, yeah. Um, Brian just uh, noted that uh, Slicer, or rather Slick3R, <laughs> also has conditional G-code, so you can set your layer change code to if layer number equals 1, 2, 3, 4, change temp, and so on, and if. The thing, of course, is, as far as I understand it, that, that is something that, would, that you would need to take care of um, during, yeah, during slicing, right, and not, not on the run. Yeah. But still interesting to know. I didn't know that yet. Okay, so um, I think that was all for this time. Uh, thank you for uh, watching and um, yeah, the next broadcast will be again in approximately one month plus minus uh, a couple, uh, yeah, rather plus a couple of weeks if push comes to shove. I am not completely aware yet of my, my schedule. Um, but what I really, really hope is that then we will have uh, way less heat in here. <laughs> and um, yeah, I hope it was interesting, uh, despite me stumbling over my tongue way more often than usual. <laughs> At least it felt that way. Um, and uh, yeah, to those of you watching this live, I wish you a very, very nice rest of the weekend. And in any case, I wish all of you watching this, uh, yeah, continued happy printing and until next time. Bye.